Thank you for tuning in to Movie Geeks United. Leslie Chilcott has built a career as a maker of socially conscious films. She explored the failing education system as a producer of Waiting for Superman, ignited a widespread dialogue on climate change when she produced An Inconvenient Truth and its sequel, and exposed the wonders and destruction of marine life in her recent directorial effort, Watson. Her latest work is a bit of a change of pace. Helter Skelter, an American myth, is a six-part, six-hour dissection of the Manson family and the environments and circumstances that made them possible. The film premieres on Epics on Sunday, July 26th. You know, looking over your, your resume, and, you know, I'm I'm so in, in, crazy about the documentary form, and you've been involved in so many great ones. Uh, I mean, this is quite a bit different from what you're what you're accustomed to exploring and i'm wondering did it did it take some convincing for you to get on board this subject matter there are no whales in this series so yes it did <laughs> <laughs> it did in fact um when i first heard from eli frankel and elizabeth davies who are the um two of the executive producers uh when they called me initially you know they said hey how would you do this how would you do that and you know, the next day, some more questions. How, how, how would we do this? And, and I was like, man, you people are obsessed with this story, you know? Mm. And, um, as we talked more and more, I was, I kind of was like, why? Why are so many people fascinated by the series of truly, you know, horrific murders? Um, and I thought, you know what? Maybe, maybe I could do, like a dig, like an archaeological or an anthropological dig and, and do a dive and talk about the late 60s and place it in cultural context to try and figure out how something like this could have happened. And so that that piqued my interest. Yeah. And it, it really, you're talking about a dig. I mean, you're digging through 50 years of of in, <laughs> endless research, endless books, endless movies, TV specials. I mean, did you, you had to have considered... You know how can I how can my project stand out from from all of that which has come before? Right, right. Yeah, I think that's right. I think it is surprising though that despite all of that coverage, there's never been a long form television show or documentary or film that told the entire story. You know, right. there's there's been things that have focused on certain aspects of it. But nothing kind of, you know, beginning to end. And and we don't even go to the end. We just go to the trial and the, the convictions. You know, there's there's more that happened after that. But there's so many twists and turns that, that hadn't been explored. And I think, you know, if you only have an hour, you have to simplify things. Right. And, um, you know, it was our goal to, you know, maybe no new family members would talk to us. And, and if that was the case, we would do deeper dives with the ones that were willing to talk to us. You know, we would talk to the reporters that were in the courtroom every single day. Um, but we kind of made our case, you know, and, and, and we said, this is not going to be tabloid-esque. You know, is there something you'd like to say? Do you want something out there? Do you want to atone for something? Do you, you know, and slowly but surely, um, we were able to um, find footage and photos and people that have never been seen before. You know, everybody's like, never before seen footage. Um, but really, we we have, you know, film footage that was transferred for this project that literally is never before seen. So, um, and where, where were so those, yeah. where were those kept? What archive were, were those in, that footage? We found a lot of good sources by going abroad because um, there's a lot of um, reporters and, and people in other countries that have also been fascinated with this case, other filmmakers. Um, so there was sort of a trove from there. Um, when I interviewed someone, I asked to look through their personal photos and um, you know artifacts so that we could scan and film some of those. A lot of the a lot of the stuff we filmed in camera as opposed to scanning it. Mm. Um, you know, uh, uh, Sandy Gibbons, who was in the courthouse every single day of all the reporters, happened to save her teletypes from that period. And because she saved those teletypes, um, you know, I, I got the idea of, shoot, of shooting with an old teletype and, and shooting 
certain, you know, chapter headings. Right. Um, the teletypes that come up are chapter headings, and then, you know, whatever is in the teletype is spoken by someone, you know, within a, a few minutes of that. And then we scanned her real teletypes and used them later. So we did kind of a, a both a scientific and an artistic approach to it. You know, we have some, some tapes that um, – Steve Oney, who did this wonderful um, oral history um, of the Manson family um, uh, about 11 years ago, had saved his tapes, and we transcribed those and transferred them. And so there's audio interviews um, with Barbara Hoyt, for example, who's now deceased, that that no one has heard before. Mm. And then, sorry for the long-winded answer, but I want to be thorough. No, no, it's I am beautiful. A you, you, you know, I am I I am a uh, true crime aficionado, but even more than that, I am an a Los Angeles history aficionado, and so okay. it, so it really the, this whole saga really fascinates me. And when you put it in the context of what it meant to L. A. and in in larger terms to the culture at large, uh, that was particularly yeah. interesting to me. Could you give me a, a sense of what you found surprising about what the aftermath of this, what it meant to L.A. and how that kind of echoed throughout the world? Yeah, I think um, for me, especially because I traditionally do different types of documentaries, as as, as you mentioned, I wanted to sort of set the, the social scene for the late 60s here in Los Angeles and the, mm. the U.S. as a whole. And talk about, you know, the protests that were going on, the race rebellions that were going on, the hallucinogens that were being taken, the music people were listening to, and communal living. You know, that 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 was kind of all those things mixed together, you know, combined with people using LSD for the first time. There were new freedoms. Um, but on the flip side, there were also new horrors. So... I wanted to do, you know, do a cultural history of the 67, 68, 69 period um, in in Los Angeles. And then Charlie Manson and his family would sort of interrupt that, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah, that's a fascinating part of the story, how how that movement kind of ended up turning in on itself. It turned it turned uh, ugly. Uh, it, and it did. Man- Manson and, you know, was like the poster child for that <laughs> evolution. And that's kind of one of the the myths. I mean, there is no myth about the the horrible murders being committed and that Manson family members did it, you know, Um, in terms of Tate and LaBianca. Um, But there's a lot of myths. You know, people say now, oh, Charlie just masterminded things. He didn't actually do anything. Well, that's not even true. Um, He did mastermind those crimes, but he was part of the Gary Hinman murder, which was a few weeks earlier. He helped kill Shorty Shea, the ranch hand, which was a few weeks later, you know. He tried to kill lots of Papa, uh, uh, you know. He tried, yeah. yeah, he yeah, you're right. He thought he had killed lots of Papa. And then, you know, another myth is that people portray him as this, you know, bearded Stengali who had all of the answers and this enlightened guru. And really most of his acid rap was oversimplifications of things and, and ripped off philosophy, you know, from other sources. And while he had no trouble convincing his family members that, that a race riot might be coming, well, that's because there were 200 race riots, riots, excuse me, you know, nationwide happening in the late 60s. And so they believed him, but he mm. was not an orchestrator, you know, of any of that. So I think there's some things that, that we look at that, that haven't been looked at before and kind of place it in the cultural context um, of the time. Sorry, you, I felt like I cut you off there. No, no, no. Uh, um, towards the end of your film, y- you... You kind of in, inject the notion that who knows if this helter skelter theory is the reality. Uh, you know, yep. it, it's what was presented to us, and it's kind of fed itself over the past fifty years. Do you have doubts that uh, that that was truly the motive? I do. Yeah, and I don't think you know what people forget is. The prosecution does not have the burden to prove motive. They have to prove the crimes, right? But they don't have to prove the motive. And um, Bugliosi and his team decided to try and prove a motive because the crimes were were kind of motiveless. They appeared to be motiveless, and they were 
inexplicable. Like you couldn't explain them. Like the the puzzle pieces, you know, it, they didn't fit. You know, the boxes weren't square. And I think that you know, it was such a crazy story that I think he felt that he had to prove his motive. And family members and people heard Charlie talking about a race war. And, you know, he assembled that information and shared that information. Mm. But portraying him as this organized criminal that had any sort of plan, um, you know, that, that's, that's not the reality. Did Charlie believe a race war was coming? Maybe. Did he think he could start it? I doubt it. Yeah. And it's kind of, I feel like, you know, what theory could you come up with that would make sense of that degree of slaughter? I mean, I think it's an attempt to kind of put it in a box and make sense of it, but I don't think there really is a sense to be made from it. Um, I don't think, I don't think there is. I think there's important lessons that we can learn. I think whenever you, you give a piece of yourself up to a guru or a cult leader or someone who simply repeats lies over and over again until you start to believe them. You know, they isolate you from the real truth. They're silent, you know, they're loving and then they're hurtful or they're loving and then they're abusive. I mean, Mm -hmm. these are, now we know, these are classic cult leader type traits. And I think that after Charlie killed Lots of Papa, he really thought that Lots of Papa his friends, he he mistakenly allegedly believed that Lots of Papa was a Black Panther, and Charlie believed that there would be revenge and that they were in danger. Mm. And, you know, family family members were starting to question him, and he needed a way to endear them to him. And creating this outside threat is another classic, you know, almost a lot of these cult leaders say the apocalypse is coming, you know? Right. And they they create this otherness. And, you know, despite growing up in prison, he was quite, and, or maybe because of it, he was he was quite skilled at this. But were, were the people that were murdered, were they specifically chosen by him? No. He went to places he knew, places he was familiar with, and um, asked the family to commit these murders so that they he could then protect them and they would be indebted to him in some way. And it's, it's a very weird thing to get your head around, Mm. you know, how would that make that indebted? But, but he would, he would protect them from what they did because they did it for a valuable reason. You know, there was no separation between life and death and, and all of this other stuff that he used to spew. And I think that we still talk about it because it doesn't make sense, but um, and Charlie preyed on that. And yeah. I think that, you know, we're, we're kind of his puppets by continuing to, to talk about it. And, um, let's well, move on. Well, I think that, you know, but it's still a, 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 a human factor today that, you know, people, yeah. people can prey upon our weaknesses and insecurities and, and, uh, really promote a discord. I mean, we've seen that today. But, uh, my last question for yeah, you, sure. um, you know, last year I was. You, you have some great uh, interview subjects in this. I was particularly delighted to see somebody like the the two Rolling Stone writers that did that. Uh, I know. It was David awesome. Dalton and David Felton. Yeah, and, and last year I did a a little series on on the not the murders themselves, but the people that were on the periphery of the murders that hadn't really been spoken to before. So uh, I had um, the delivery driver. At Cielo, a couple of hours, you know, the guy that delivered the bicycle. I had uh, Stephen yes. Par- uh, Stephen Parent's girlfriend spoke to me. Uh, so I'm fascinated. I'm fascinated by all the characters on the periphery of this. And I'm wondering, was there were, were there people or a person that you tried really hard to get but you weren't able to? Yes, there were quite a there were a few people that you know, said to us, um, thank you so much for calling. That will never happen. Goodbye. <laughs> you know, and they've, they've never spoken about their time with the family and probably, you know, never will. Yeah. And then there were some people that, you know, I asked them to hear me out and, and I wanted to explain or, you know, our, our um, research producer, Jen Mullins, and, and also our supervising producer, Rebecca Halpern, they would say, listen, just, just listen for a second. I know this is difficult, but, you know, is there something that you wished was out there? Because we're not going to take a tabloid-esque approach. We're going to take, you know, we're going to do a, a, a deeper dive and attempt to 
you know, explain this. And there were absolutely some people, um, you know, that you saw in episode one and in some later episodes that, that talked to us, um, you know, that haven't talked before. There's also an interesting phenomenon that happens when you're in LA. Like you spoke to the guy who delivered the, the, the bicycle, bicycle to Abigail Folger, right? That yeah. happened at like seven o'clock that night. His brother happens to run the post house where we did, you know, the the color correction for wow. this series. And mm. I would think, oh, that's crazy, you know? And um, so I would talk to him about that and what his brother, and then I would go somewhere else and they would be like, yeah, my uncle was the guy that picked Charlie up when this happened. And it's like six degrees of separation, right? It's like, you don't have to, to, to go very far in Los Angeles before you find someone that had some sort of connection. Yeah. And also there were quite a few family members, you know? Mm. Yeah. That's, that what's came so, and went. that's so fascinating that, that, that whole saga is so intricately intertwined with the, even the Los Angeles of today. I mean, it's, it still lives there.